In almost all cultures prior to Christianity, the killing of babies, known as infanticide, was a common practice. According to researchers Susan Scrimshaw and James Dennis, it was the norm in Greco-Roman culture, in India, China, Japan, Brazil, pagan Africa, amongst the Indians of North and South America, and the Eskimos. Babies particularly at risk were the deformed, disabled, or just the female. In ancient cultures, male babies were more prized than female ones, so in Greece, for example, it was rare for even a wealthy family to raise more than one daughter. Indeed, an ancient inscription at Delphi in Greece states that in the second century, only 1% of families there raised more than one daughter. Disabled babies were simply seen as subhuman and were drowned. In many pagan cultures, babies were also killed as a form of sacrifice to pagan gods like Baal and Asherah. Near Mount Carmel, on the site of the ancient city of Megiddo, archaeologists have discovered the remains of infants who, under the corrupt reign of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel in 9 BC, had been sacrificed in a temple of Asherah. This was very typical in pagan cultures. The pre-Christian Irish were well known to be into this behaviour as well, and the Lithuanians and Prussians carried out child sacrifice right up until the 14th century. British author Edward Ryan says that they would have done so to this day were it not for Christianity. Druidic forms of paganism were particularly nasty on this front, and the same thing went on in Aztec and Mayan culture. It was the spread of Christianity through European settlers that led to the outlawing of all types of infanticide. Christianity, of course, claimed that all human life contained the image of God, and therefore all were equally valuable to him. Babies that weren't killed in Greco-Roman culture were often just abandoned. Euripides, the Greek poet from 5 BC, mentions infants being thrown into rivers and manure piles, exposed on roadsides, and left for prey to birds and wild animals. Greek and Roman literature is full of stories of abandoned children, and in Sparta, when any child was born, it had to be taken before the tribal elders, who would then decide whether the child should be kept or simply thrown away. It was Christians like Clement of Alexandria and Tertullian who led the campaign against these atrocities. Indeed, Christians didn't just protest against these practices, but were also willing to go the extra mile and proactively set about caring for abandoned children by establishing orphanages, foster homes and drop-off points at churches. This was revolutionary stuff at the time. Callistus was known for finding homes for abandoned children, and Benegus of Dijon provided protection and nourishment for children, some of whom were deformed by failed abortions. This effort changed worldviews and eventually led to the outlawing of child abandonment. It was also Christians that changed attitudes towards abortion, which was again very prevalent in Greco-Roman culture. Respect and honour for marriage became completely extinct in Roman culture, and chaste women were said by Juvenal to be non-existent. As they slept around, they inevitably became pregnant, and as they became pregnant, they inevitably needed to dispose of the evidence of their unfaithfulness. This meant abortion rates went through the roof. Human life was cheap and expandable in those days. Philosophers like Plato, Aristotle and Celsus, and others well after Christ, had no compunctions about taking the life of an unborn child. It was Christians that stood against the culture of the day to unequivocally condemn it. The Christian Athenagoras wrote to the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius to express his outrage at the practice. Tertullian also spoke of the Christian position when he said, We may not destroy even the fetus in the womb, nor does it matter whether you take away the life that is born or destroy one that is coming from birth. As historian W. E. H. Leckie says, the value and sanctity of infant life broadly distinguished Christian from pagan societies. There was a marked contrast between Christians and the culture around them. Adult life was cheap and expendable to the Greeks and Romans too. Gladiatorial shows where humans killed and were killed for entertainment was the norm. Each contest required men to fight men and often animals too. The barbaric cruelty, the agonizing screams of the victims and the flow of human blood stirred no conscience in the crowd who cheered and bayed for more slaughter. Christians were appalled by this gambling with human life and boycotted and condemned it. This too brought them into conflict with the pagan Romans. Minicius Felix cites a Roman pagan who strongly criticised Christians for their anti-gladiatorial stance, saying, You do not go to our shows, you take no part in our processions, you shrink in horror from our sacred gladiatorial games. 
The Romans hated these Christians who wouldn't join in and go with the cultural flow. Eventually, as Jerome Carsipino says, the butcheries of the arena were stopped at the command of Christian emperors. Lecky concurs saying, There is scarcely any single reform so important in the moral history of mankind as the suppression of the gladiatorial shows, a feat that must be almost exclusively ascribed to the Christian church. For similar reasons as those described previously, it was Christians who changed attitudes towards suicide, which was seen as honourable and romantic in Roman and some Asian cultures amongst others. It was also Christian missionaries who ended cannibalism in many tribal cultures around the world. In fact, I remember hearing the anecdotal story of a communist explorer who encountered a jungle tribe and did proceed to warn them about Christianity and its missionaries. If any should ever come this way, don't listen to their fairy tales, was his message. The tribal chief listened intently to his tirade and then explained to the communist that he should be very glad of those missionaries whom he hates and warns against, for some had actually passed through their camp some time ago, and if they hadn't done so, the tribe would have eaten him by now, as was their custom before the missionaries brought them the gospel. The Christian influence that had gone before had civilized the tribe, ended cannibalism, and saved the atheist's life. And that is a microcosmic picture of what has happened in the world at large. As Christianity has spread, it has civilized the world. The atheists that follow enjoy the benefits of that civilizing effect, but speak against its source. The complete debasement of marriage may have been a problem in Greco-Roman culture, but it was the spread of Christianity that restored the value, dignity and sanctity of marriage between one man and one woman. The Bible says that when a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, they become united into one flesh. In promoting this idea, Christianity helped establish the building blocks of a stable and prosperous society. It was also Christians who opposed and ended the acceptance and practice of paedophilia, which was a cultural norm in Greco-Roman society. In fact, so ingrained was this practice into their culture that even the emperors had these abhorrent relationships. Emperor Nero had at least two boys called Sporus and Pythagoras, and Sporus was sickeningly castrated so that he could assume the role of wife for Nero. Nero's successor was a man called Galba, and he had at least one male lover. Emperor Hadrian had a young boy called Antinous, and Emperor Commodus, along with his 300 concubines, also had 300 young boys on staff to satisfy his sexual appetite. Christianity was responsible for opposing this and changing the cultural norms. It was also Christians who opposed homosexuality in general, which was increasingly common in Greco-Roman society. It was Christians who first changed attitudes to women. Apart from the regular killing of baby girls, women in general were deprived of basic freedoms in Greco-Roman times. In India's Hindu culture, when a man died, his wife was expected to climb onto his funeral pyre and be burned alive along with him, a practice called sati or sati. In contrast, Christianity was teaching the world that widows should be cared for in their old age, and it was British authorities, because of an embedded Christian influence, who eventually outlawed sati. In the Quran, women were, and still are, given half the value of men, can be used how they want by men, and can be taken as sex slaves by men, where it was through Christianity that women were given equal value. As Galatians 3.28 says, There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This set a precedent for the equality of men and women, and the New Testament reports many women who had an influential role in the early church. Phoebe was a deacon, Priscilla was described as a co-worker in Paul's ministry, and Lydia, Lewis and Eunice are given special mentions, and there are many more heroines in the Bible, even from the Old Testament times, such as Esther and Deborah. That contrasting attitude meant that while women were liberated wherever Christianity spread, others in pagan cultures remained enslaved, sometimes even to this day. Look at where Christianity has had most influence and then correlate it with where women have the most freedom. I'm sure you will not be surprised to see the connection. It was also Christian missionaries who led the campaign to abolish things like boot binding of women in China. Before Christianity, little or no dignity was given to women at all.